in the age of the coronavirus. Professor Balram. Thank you very much, Devang, for that introduction. I'd like to thank the INSA Council for inviting me to give this lecture. What I'm going to do over the next hour is to really talk in general about chemistry and biology, subtitled it in the age of the coronavirus, because we really dominated by the coronavirus for the last two years. I'm going to tell you a little bit about chemicals in nature and a story an abridged history of the coronavirus, a little biology, a little chemistry, and towards the end, are some reflections on the evolutionary history of the coronavirus spike protein during the pandemic. On this slide, I pictured the two foundational pillars of chemistry and biology. Mendeleev on the left and his periodic table, and Darwin on the right with his ideas of natural selection and evolution. As I expected, Devan, now my slide doesn't move. <laughs> it was moving before. <laughs> I think maybe you can stop sharing and try again. I I'll stop sharing and start again. This is the... <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, uh, I think we I all... I think you can... Uh, we all experience this. So I think it's pretty normal. It's a, it's a, you can share the whole screen or something like that. Yeah, I'll to... share the full screen now hmm. and see if it moves. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Now, when we talk about science, we are really talking about nature. And uh, the very first issue of uh, nature, of the journal Nature, in 1869, had this editorial by Thomas Huxley. What he did was, he never wrote it. He merely translated from the German an essay written by the German poet von Goethe, who defined nature, who described oh. nature. And in Goethe's words, nature is surrounded and embraced by her, powerless to separate ourselves from her and powerless to penetrate beyond her. The two most important journals in science are called Science and Nature. And uh, you can then see the connectivity. On the left, uh, one which gives us coffee, and the other one which gives us uh, which is the opium coffee, which gives us morphine. Botanists for a long time have worried about the diversity of plant species. Chemists have worried about the diversity of molecules in nature. Why do plants make these complex molecules? And then ask question. Well, natural products are now made by microorganisms, by plants, by animals. And therefore, zoology, botany, microbiology are all producing chemicals. Some of them in biochemistry we call private. But secondary metabolites are really a misnomer because there is nothing secondary about secondary metabolism. I found this definition, blended idiosyncratic diversity of nature endowing different species with specific solutions to biological problems. The plants and microorganisms don't make these molecules for our benefit. They really make these molecules for their own benefit. In biology, one word which is often used is diversity. And in chemistry also, there is a bewildering diversity of molecules. So you, you might ask, how many chemicals are produced in nature? This would be chemical space. How many living organisms are there in nature? That would be biologists. We might then ask, how are these chemicals synthesized, which would be the biosynthesis, which would now require genes and enzymes. We might then ask a more important question, why are these chemicals necessary for the organism? It is a biological impact. <laughs> 
due to a interaction or due to interference between a uh, between two different strength resonances that is which this is of course very important now something again has happened there was an interruption i think all the listeners could be asked to kindly mute their microphones i guess i'll have to uh, there was something okay. saying recording in progress and uh, i will share screen the screen, your screen is no longer shared yes i know the screen went off when this recording in progress notice came along I hope you can see it. Yes, we can. You can. Let's see if it becomes full screen now. Are you able to see full screen? Oh, shall I? I, I ah, no, I think it's going off by itself. Yeah, actually, it's not full screen. It appears. Uh, I know. Uh, I'm having difficulty. All of a sudden, now it's full screen. Yes, it is. Now it's fine. Yeah, yeah it's okay. The last question: How are the chemicals of one organism recognized by the target organism? It's a very important question because it raises the issue of recognition of small molecules by protein prizes. We realize that this year's Nobel Prize for uh, Physiology and Medicine really dealt with molecules which are. are really the keys to understanding how we sense a temperature how we taste chemicals and so forth do you a structure here uh, which is the structure of capsaicin uh, the substance which really gives the red pepper its uh, pungent taste now it's put together in nature by a biosynthetic pathway which you see on the left of the slide Every arrow in that biosynthetic pathway requires an enzyme, and every enzyme requires a gene in order to make it. Therefore, the plant now spends an enormous amount of metabolic energy in put it, putting together capsaicin. Obviously, doing this for its own purpose. One of the problems with the complex chemistry of natural products is that substrates. when they are converted to products require genes and enzymes and for a multi step biosynthetic pathway these unique <laughs> enzymes must be encoded by separate genes and then you need clusters of genes and modular assembly so in a way almost all the diversity that you see in the chemistry of natural products is because of this remarkable ability of proteins to catalyze chemical reaction and francis crick as early as 1958 said that the main function of proteins is to act as enzymes he also anticipated what we are discussing today when he said it is at first sight paradoxical that it is probably easier for an organism to produce a new protein than to produce a new small molecule and this is something that always is of interest to chemists to enter biology but we've been dominated by the coronavirus since last march and uh, what do you do when uh, everything locks down and you're stuck in your room you begin to read and i read this article last year in the new yorker and it's a very interesting article which had this title as hurting make us human What this article described was a lady who you see pictured on the left, a Scottish lady, who, because of a combination of genetic quirks, her ne negative emotional range was extremely limited. She had the inability to feel unhappy, and she had an expansive capacity for positive emotions. 
more importantly, she was entirely insensitive to physical pain. So when such a subject is found, then of course the geneticists got into the act and they discovered what was wrong or what was right. And this appeared in the British Journal of Anesthesia in 2019. And it is this metabolic effect that was present. The molecule on the left, anandamide, which you produce in your brain, is hydrolyzed by an enzyme, fatty acid amide hydrolase, where arachidonic acid and ethanol amine. Arachidonic acid is a known constituent of lipids, a product of lipid oxidation also. Ethanol amine is a constituent of uh, biological membranes and phosphatidyl ethanol amine. It's also a part of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So it's this simple metabolic reaction that a chemical produced in the brain is now broken down. And this fatty acid amide hydrolase gene had a defect in it. Now, the amide hydrolases are a fairly widespread class of enzymes. We have to ask the question, where did the molecule on the left, which is called anandamide, appears to have an Indian connection now, where did it appear from? Now, I go back in the story to tell you that we really begin with the molecule pictured on the top left of the slide, tetrahydrocannabinol. It has an impressive name, it's the active constituent of hashish. It's the active constituent of marijuana. It's what is produced by the cannabis plant. Now, the structure of tetrahydrocannabinol was worked out by an Israeli scientist, Rafael Meshulam, in 1964. It has that complex structure that you see on the top left of the slide. But Meshulam then asked a very interesting question. If Cannabinol acts on the brain, and today, of course, we are very interested in marijuana because the narcotic bureau catches people who have a few grams of it, and it's been consumed for centuries now. Meshulam asked this interesting question. How is it recognized by the brain? To what receptors does it bind? And therefore, they must be cannabinoid receptors. But if there are receptors in the brain for the cannabinoids, Obviously, they have not been put there to recognize cannabinoids. Evolution must have put them there to recognize an endogenous molecule. So what is the endogenous molecule? The endogenous molecule is the molecule on the bottom left, anandamide. And so what Mishulam did over the next few decades is to try and find this molecule. So he took, and I will show you on the next slide, he started off with four and a half kilograms of pig brain, mashed it up, and then went through the classical procedures of chemical isolation to end up with about half a milligram of a molecule whose structure he then determined. The determination of the structure, even in the 1990s, was by techniques which we would consider primitive today. And you can see the structure of anandamide determined with an electron impact spectrum at that time. On the left, you see something. I see Professor Talwar here would recognize the radioligand uh, displacement assay, and the classic assay is used now to ensure that the molecule he's isolated binds to the receptor. So it actually isolated an endogenous ligand. So we make anandamide in the brain, keeps us happy, and if we have a defect in the enzyme which hydrolyzes it, then of course uh, anandamide accumulates and you're always happy. And uh, this is, of course, the kind of condition that smokers of hashish would like to get in. Meshulam was asked then, why did you coin a name from Sanskrit and why didn't you take a Hebrew name? And then he said, we looked for a Hebrew name, but as you may well be aware, Jews are not very happy. We have a lot of words for being down and so on, but not so many words for extreme joy. So we must take pleasure in the fact that our ancestors were, in fact, a very joyful people. But our joys have been short-lived. Even as I read this article, I began to see in the newspapers pictures like this. The coronavirus had begun to capture the imagination of policemen in Sekandrabad, auto rickshaw drivers in Chennai and everywhere, chefs in Italy and France, and the image of the coronavirus was there all over. I, of course, knew nothing about the coronavirus at that time, so I wanted to ask myself the question, 
Uh, what is the coronavirus? Where did it come from? Why is it doing this to us? Of course, the burden of the coronavirus pandemic is now well known. This is a somewhat old slide, about six months old. It's much larger. The figures are much larger now. But the death toll has been staggering. Now, the definition of a virus, and I'm not a biologist, was one which I found in a philosophical dictionary of biology entitled Aristotle's Zoos. This was written by the English immunologist Peter Medever, and he defined a virus as a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein. So effectively, the bad news is the genetic material, and what protects the genetic material is the protein caught outside the virus. We might add, it's also in the coronavirus because it's an enveloped virus, a little bit of membrane, a phospholipid bilayer. So the first thing to remember is the coronavirus is an enveloped virus. Uh, the picture on the left is the one which is distributed by the Center for Disease Control and everybody can use it. And I've shown you a picture which was derived much later by electron micro uh, by microscopy of what the surface of the coronavirus might actually look like. But you can see now that the constant injunctions over the last one and a half years of washing your hands and using sanitizers are really to break the phospholipid bilayer and disintegrate the virus. This is not new. William Osler, one of the founding fathers of modern medicine, said that soap and water and common sense are the best disinfectants. We have a lot of soap and water nowadays, but we have a sort of shortage of common sense. Why must we learn about the coronavirus? The best advice that I found was given by Michael Corleone in The Godfather, who said, keep your friends close, but your enemy is closer. And therefore, I spent the first couple of months in the lockdown in trying to find out who discovered the coronavirus. In the next few slides, I'll tell you that story. This is what happened between March and May of 2020. It turned out that what I found, I wrote in an Indian magazine. And that article was picked up and reproduced in a historic, in a newsletter on local history by the small town of Ure in Colorado, which has a population of 1,000. Because what I successfully did here is to trace the first person who isolated the first coronavirus to the place in Ure, Colorado, where she died many years ago. I was interviewed by an archivist at the Northern Arizona University. And I told her at that time that it is a tribute to the power of the internet that the road from Ure to Flagstaff passes through Bangalore. It also seems to me that in some strange way, the virus has led us to its discoverer by turning the world upside down. Because what I did really was, I wrote this article, but what I really did was to go back and read the first papers on the coronavirus. This is a 1967 paper written by June Almeida and David Perel, and this describes the morphology of three viruses, which were previously unknown, human respiratory viruses. The electron micrograph, the very first one of the coronavirus taken by June Almeida, is pictured here in the center of the slide. And then Terrell and Almeida wrote this. He said that the most interesting findings were the two viruses which they got from human beings 229E and B814 are morphologically identical with avian infectious bronchitis. So it was a virus known to veterinarians, and now it had been discovered in humans, and electron microscopy, then a new technique had been applied. But in reading papers, I like to read the footnotes, I like to read the acknowledgments, and I like to read the figure legends. And when I went and looked at the figure legends for the uh, electron micrograph, I found that the picture was of a strain 229E. And when I went to the acknowledgement, I found it acknowledged Dr. D. Hamre for the 229E virus. With a lot of time on my hands, I now began to search for Dr. D. Hamre and found the 1966 paper, which is in the Proceedings of the Society of Experimental Biology and Medicine by Dorothy Hamre and John Proctor. I now realized that it was a lady from the name Dorothy and that she isolated 229E. And this is the first coronavirus demonstrated as a human pathogen. 
But Dorothy Hamre was a remarkable uh, scientist because what she did was she also found that it was an RNA virus by showing that it was not inhibited by substances which inhibit DNA synthesis. She also determined the size of the virus by classical methods and broke it down as 89 millimicrons, which in today's units is 89 nanometers. I also found another paper in 2018, which said that there was a rare case of human coronavirus associated acute respiratory distress syndrome in a healthy adult. So occasionally in some people, even this virus caused an enormous problem. Now, David Terrell's paper one year later also estimated the size of the virus, and it was 80 to 100 nanometers. So they were all doing very well. And the term coronavirus appeared in the scientific literature in 1968 in the form of a letter written to the editor of Nature. It was not a publication. The editor summarized the letter in his own words in a column in the news column and said that a new group of viruses has been discovered. I found Dorothy Hamray's name there. But sometime later, when the virologists named it formally, her name had disappeared in 1975. I was interested in asking a question, what did she look like? I went to the literature, to, and well, where do you go? You go to Google. Then under Google Images, I found many pictures of young ladies, old ladies. None of them was a virologist. Some were too young, and uh, most of them were nobody was a biologist, and therefore they were not the right person. I then searched PubMed, Google Scholar, and found that she had 40 publications between 43 and 1972. This meant she was a productive scientist, and one could trace her career beginning in bacteriology in 1941 and transitioning to virology and ending the career in 1972. Yet there was no photograph. So I began now conducting correspondence with archivists where I did find an archive in which her name was mentioned. I wrote to them, they were in a university in Arizona, and then through the email, I eventually found that they had a collection. They didn't know who she was. And then when I said that she might be the discoverer of the coronavirus, they were very enthusiastic. And despite lockdowns in Arizona, they produced pictures for me. And today, if I were to summarize the discoverers of the coronavirus, these are the pictures that I would show. This is what I learned about the coronavirus, but I learned something else. The period between 1937 and 1972, when Dorothy Hamlet did her work, was in fact a very difficult period. The years of the Great Depression, the Second World War, and the immediate aftermath. None of these was a particularly helpful for a woman trying to make a career in a U.S. university. She eventually retired from the University of Chicago as a research associate, although she was a leading expert on rhinoviruses and coronaviruses. So today, when INSA uh, now decides to look at the problems of women in science, they might go back sometimes and recognize women who have been in science and who have done very well. In 1996, David Terrell summarized everything that he'd learned about coronaviruses in a chapter in a book on medical microbiology. And he said, coronaviruses cause acute, mild, upper respiratory infection, common cold. Most human viruses fall into these serotypes. The result is coronaviruses were no longer investigated with great enthusiasm by virologists. But Tyrell could not have been more wrong. In 2002-2003, SARS-CoV-1, which was the first SARS epidemic, took place, began in southern China, was first recognized in Vietnam, and the WHO at that time sent Carlo Urbani, an Italian doctor, to the hospital in Hanoi, where he recognized he was dealing with a new disease. Thanks to his persuasion, Remarkable quarantine measures were imposed at that time. But Urbani contacted the disease and died a few days later after having discovered this new disease. We haven't paid sufficient tribute to Urbani in India during this particular pandemic. When we had our lockdown, it was in the first lockdown, it was in fact 
the anniversary of his death. But over the years, it has now been recognized that this might be a zoonotic disease in which virus transfer happens, adaptation happens when it goes from animal hosts to human. But I want to digress into chemistry at this point. I'm going to come back to the coronavirus and its sequences a little later. Why is chemistry important? Chemistry, as defined by Arthur Kornberg, he said chemistry is the lingua franca of the medical and biological science. There's almost very little that you can understand well in medicine and biology unless you understand your chemistry well. Is chemistry important? All you have to do is to go to the Feynman lectures in physics and look at the first volume and the first chapter. Where Feynman says matter is made up of atoms. And then he asks a question. He says, if in some cataclysm, all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed, and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? Very difficult question. The answer is, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis or the atomic fact or whatever you wish to call it, that all things are made up of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. You can't begin a discussion better than this of chemistry. What, dif what is the difference between chemistry and biology? It's really only length scales and time scales, sometimes energy scales. But in reality, we're talking about the same thing. Biology is complex chemistry. And you can see that as we go from one direction to the other, we go many orders of magnitude in both length and time. The virus, of course, sits somewhere in the middle, somewhere between the ribosome and the mitochondria. The importance of chemistry is best summarized by this cartoon, where you have this man solving a crossword puzzle. He asks the lady sitting next to him, what's a nine-letter word for biotechnology? He answers chemistry. Since I'm talking to the Indian National Science Academy, I might say that what is a nine-letter word for material science on which we spend so much money and time? That's also chemistry. Now, why is chemistry difficult for students to follow, for instance? Because chemistry and mathematics are somewhat more foreign when you're young than biology and physics. Because you see biology all around you, you can sense it, physics, you recognize it all around, Newton's laws of motion, you relate to because you also move, you feel gravity. But chemistry and mathematics differ because of their symbolic languages. Chemical structures are as much the alphabets of chemistry as symbols, equations are of mathematics. And unless one learns this language, it is sometimes difficult to appreciate the nuances and the diversity of chemistry. But in trying to make a case for chemistry, I can't do better than, of course, to take the help of the Prime Minister. And in fact, after the last elections in 2019, the Prime Minister declared that chemistry defeated arithmetic in the 2019 polls. The so politicians have an instinctive understanding of what the words chemistry and mathematics really means, because in their parlance, chemistry is, of course, the chemistry of interactions between human beings. The foundational pillars of chemistry are illustrated on the slide. I have Mendeleev for diversity, Wohler for unity. After all, he converted uh, ammonium cyanate into urea. Boltzmann, a physicist, but the man who first recognized the reality of atoms when he worked on heat and introduced the concept of entropy for dynamics. And Pasteur, of course, who gave us the ideas of structure. Pasteur, better known as a microbiologist, laid the foundations of organic stereochemistry. But before I go away from chemistry, I want to draw your attention to a book which is a favorite of mine, Ascent of Man, uh, based on a BBC series by the physicist Jacob Ronofsky. Ronofsky traces the evolution of human beings over time, and every peak or what he calls cultural evolution is actually a, a, an advance in science and technology. But he describes the building up of elements in an interesting way. 
He says, in all the stars, there are going on processes which build up the atoms one by one into more complex structures. Biology has really come from what the earth has given us, all the elements that are there. Then he uses a very interesting sentence. He says, matter itself evolves. The word comes from Darwinian biology, but it is the word that changed physics in my lifetime. And then he goes on to say how wonderfully carbon is formed by the collision of three human, uh, helium nuclei. And then he says, every carbon atom in every living creature has been formed by such a wildly improbable collision. This tells us how improbable life really is, how improbable the biology that we see around us, how improbable it is in the context of the universe itself. We'll now return to the virus. The SARS episode of 2002-2003 triggered off a wave of scientific investigation. Nothing which has been done after 2020, in 2020, is particularly new. Much of it was then done before. This is in 2006, and you can see our new pictures of the coronavirus come from electron cryomicroscopy. The mean particle diameter has now been determined. It's 82 to 94 nanometers. And you can see Dorothy Hamre's 89 nanometers falls right in the middle. And so this is a great tribute to the discoverer of the coronavirus. But today, what we are concerned with primarily are the projections of the coronavirus. We recognize the coronavirus by its exterior, much in the same way that we recognize people only by their exterior appearance. What dominates the exterior of the coronavirus is the spike protein which projects out from the surface of the virus. Its structure in atomic detail has now been determined, and that's what is pictured on this slide. Not only has its structure been determined, but it's structured in complex with the human receptor, what allows it to invade the cell. That has also been determined. And you now find that there are extremely detailed atomic understanding of the components of the body. But I will pause at this point to ask a question. Do viruses belong to chemistry or do viruses belong to biology? Now you will find in the literature there are many reasons to exclude viruses from the tree of life. So the tree of life pictured on the top right of the slide will show you bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, but it will not show you viruses. But there are other views. Like do viruses, for example, exchange genes across the super kingdoms of life? So we digress back into biology before we return to the virus. But any discussion on biology must go back to Darwin, natural selection, adaptation, and evolution. And there's only one quote from the origin of species, which I would like you to see. What Darwin said was, there is grandeur in this view of life. It is several powers having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one. And that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, Endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. What are the pillars of modern biology? The pillars of modern biology are genetics erected by Mendel in the 19th century, evolution erected by Darwin again in the 19th century, and the chemistry of heredity, which was really erected in the 20th century, with Oswald Avery's uh, discovery of DNA as a pneumococcal transforming principle and the Watson Crick double helix, which then gave us what I will call the chemistry of heredity. When you say ATGC base pairs, you're talking about hydrogen bonds, you're talking about chemical structures, you're really talking about chemistry. Eventually, our knowledge of genetics, chemistry, and evolution coalesces to let us understand biology, which is a study of organisms and their behavior. Advances in genome analysis have given us gene sequences of enormous numbers of eukaryotic genomes, prokaryotic genomes, and so on. Even among the eukaryotes, some time ago, there were over about 800 genomes. There are probably many, much, many more than that now. But what this really tells you is the unity of nature. You will find on one branch of the tree which connects us to genome sequences, you will find humans, chimpanzees, rats, mice, pigs, cattle, sheep, horses, and dogs. 
And when in a country like India, we have enormous amount of difficulty in understanding relationships between pigs, cattle, sheep, and human beings, you can see that biology teaches you that nature is really uh, united by its chemistry. I should now turn to the coronavirus. What I'm going to discuss in the next few minutes is protein sequence variation by random mutation and natural selection, the case of the coronavirus spike protein. So there we have the protein pictured on the right. It's a very important protein. But before I tell you about sequence variation, I go back in time to a 1970 paper in Nature by the English evolutionist, John Maynard Smith. Maynard Smith wrote this little note. It takes about, about a page in Nature, that's all. It has no figures, it's all text. Natural selection and the concept of protein space. And he illustrated natural selection where there are single letter mutations with this little example. He took the word war, word, W-O-R-D, changed the letter, got another word, changed another letter, got another word, changed another letter, got another word, and finally converted it to gene. Each one of these words now has a specific function in the Indian language, in, in the English language. And therefore, Maynard Smith argued that evolution works in the same way. Protein sequences, there'll be a large space of protein sequences. And by single letter mutations, you will slowly select those which now have some functional implication. And you can also diversify functions as you have diversified meaning. Many years later, 40 years after Maynard Smith's paper, this paper appeared by Francis Arnold, who received the Nobel Prize some years ago. And the paper had this interesting title, The Library of Maynard Smith, My Search for Meaning in the Protein Universe. And what Arnold said was, he got in a little story written by Argentinian author, George Luis Borges. It's all of the story is shown on the slide here, so you can read it very quickly. It's called the Library of Babel. And the Library of Babel is a library, which is an infinite library in which there are books. And scholars go in there to search for the meaning of the universe. What, what meaning is there in the universe? What meaning is there in life? And they'll never find it. They will end up with like this color on the extreme right of my slide, old, and eventually you will find on the internet cartoons in which they turn into skeletons. Protein space is also very large, like an infinite library. Now the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein has 1,273 amino acid residues. It's important because it's on the surface of the virus and it is the surface of the virus which attaches to the host cell. On the host cell, there is a receptor, the angiotensin converting enzyme. So if I were to use a sort of analogy, the cov 2 spike protein is like a Trojan horse, which the Greeks entered in Helen of Troy to enter the fortress of Troy. So the virus binds to the surface of the cell and then allows the internal contents of the virus to be deposited into the cell. So what I've written here really is the sequence of the virus in a sort of circular fashion around the structure of the virus and broken, broken down that sequence into specific domains in the three-dimensional structure. Now, if you change amino acids in the sequence, you get mutants. And this is why we are all talking about mutants all the time today. There are some words which are in common language today, RT-PCR, uh, the R0 value, mutants. Everybody's looking for a new viral mutant which might now cause us greater problems. But we must understand what does the virus do? The steps to infection of the host cell, it has to bind to a receptor. It has to be a cleavage of this protein somewhere in the middle of the protein as a prelude to infection. After that, there must be membrane fusion and virus internalization. That's what they must be. All those processes require the spike protein. So it's the properties of the spike protein which are most important. I'm going to show you a little analysis, which I think, because I know nothing about uh, 
large sequence data sets. I started off knowing nothing about the virus, so I should be able to explain this to you quite easily. Right now, if you go to the NCBI database, there are over 621,000 sequences of the coronavirus isolated from human samples. There are many, many more in other databases, viral databases. But the NCBI database curates the sequences and then deposits them as spike protein sequences. So it's easy for people like me to analyze. Now, if you look at the number of mutations, the first, on the left, you'll see a table. The first virus, which appeared from the city of Wuhan, had no mutations. Then it had got one mutation, which I'm going to tell you. Then you will find a distribution of mutations. The alpha and delta variants, which have actually caused the second and the third phase of the pandemic in different places, have really been mutations which have largely contained 10 changes in the amino acid sequence. Now, you can see that if you have uh, 1,273 residues and you can put 20 letters at each one of these positions, you have an enormous, you have practically an infinite range of possibilities. But now, if you look at the number of mutations which are now available in this huge database, and then now it, look at the number of sequences which are being deposited, you will find that the number with very large numbers of mutations are really falling off. But let's look at the pandemic. This is how the pandemic has gone. So in the x-axis on the scale which I'm going to show you, every one of my figures will have days. Day one is January 1st of 2020, and the last day will be the 30th of November 2021. And this is how the Johns Hopkins site traces deaths and infections. There are three vari variants which are of great interest now, the alpha, the delta, and the Omicron mutant which just came. Those of you who wonder how the Omicron mutant was named, you will see that some letters of the Greek alphabet have been left out so as not to unnecessarily cause political offense. Now, if you look at the evolution of variants, there is one variant, only one amino acid change, and I will show you that in a moment. That is called D614G. That is, the amino acid D has become the amino acid G at position 614. This mutation has driven the pandemic all through 2021. This has been the main driver of the pandemic, and those of us who got infected in 2020 were all infected possibly with only this strain completely now present in every other variant which is now causing disease. And this is because this is now fixed and selected and fixed according to Darwin. It helps the virus. There are other mutations which I show you here at a specific position. One of them, the one in blue, which is called P681, drove the first phase of the pandemic, even in India, in this early months of 2021, completely taken over by the P681R mutation. So you can see that if you look at these distributions, you can see the wonderful transition between the blue and the black. And you can do this with sets of mutations which are common to both of them. You can look at raw data, uh, which is available now in the NCBI, and look at the variations and find out the exact times for example, in the United States, the two variants more or less coexisted in the population before the Delta variant took over. On the extreme right are the variations between these mutations. There's nothing in common between these two variants. What drove the pandemic in the United States in the spring and what is driving it much later till today. Only one amino acid is common. But between these, we have about 19 positions which can be mutated. But I'll go back to the first mutation. What the first mutation does is really allow the virus to become a little bit more flexible and therefore undergo a change in which the structural part which binds to the receptor is more exposed. What is on the picture on the left called the closed state that the receptor binding domain is down and the receptor binding domain is up. This transition 
from the blue to the red is what happens when you have that mutation. It changes a particular distance between residues a very large amount, as much as 16 angstrom, making things more further away from the body of the virus, easier to be recognized by the receptor. But for those of you who are not into chemistry, I show you the D and G chemical structures down below. It's a bit difficult to see them because I made them just before the stock I put it in. You will find that what has been removed here, here is really one, two, three, four, five, six atoms. So only six atoms have been removed out of 12,000. And the result of it would now be this dramatic driver of the pandemic. Now, this is very recent data going all the way down. And you can ask this question. This is a wonderful illustration of Darwinian evolution in action. For the fall 2020, which will be somewhere at 360, only one mutation drove the pandemic. Then you can see another variant come in, which is in green. You can see the variant which comes in in purple, which is Delta, which is also now sort of leveling off because it's the only mutant. Now at the bottom, I won't describe it here, but we now classify these variants according to an H index because we measure the impact of scientists by their H indices. So you can use such indices to also define the impact of viral sequences. And uh, in the middle in red, what you see is a, viral, uh, it's a variant which came in Brazil. We spread to the United States. It was present in fairly large numbers, but you can see that eventually it gave way, it didn't take hold. Analysis of such data will help us to understand whether one should go into a blind panic and you see mutations. And it was observed mutations important because many of the mutations which are now being made are not to improve in shape of the viral virus from antibodies already circulating in the population. You can find all over the virus. I show you some positions. This is taken from the director's blog of, at the National Institute of Health. He wrote, Francis Collins wrote this blog about a paper which appeared in Science in June of 2021. We have a lot of talk about viral vaccines. I show you this article which says virus vaccines, proteins prefer prolines. All the vaccines which have been taken abroad, the mRNA vaccines, are engineered vaccines. The AstraZeneca vaccine also has uh, uh, engineering. Only the Covaxin does not have this. Here, proline residues are placed at specific positions. In fact, two prolines at 986 and 987 in the Moderna, BioNTech, and Pfizer vaccines. This is because this allows the uh, uh, sequence which you put in to become more antigenic. It stabilizes a pre-fusion confirmation. It's in that pre-fusion confirmation that the virus must be captured if it was to be neutralized. But I'm coming now towards the end. I've told you something about very generally about chemistry and biology, a little bit more specifically about the coronavirus. But I want to go back to something that Joshua Lederberg wrote in the AIDS pandemic. The HIV pandemic was uh, at its peak in America in 1998. He wrote this article on medical science, infectious disease, and the unity of humankind. I liked particularly the phrase where he says, the unity of humankind. And he says, human intelligence, culture, and technology have left all other planet and animal species out of the competition. We also may legislate human behavior, but we have too many illusions that we can, by writ, govern the remaining vital kingdoms. The microbes that remain are competitors of last resort for dominion of the planet. The bacteria and viruses know nothing of national sovereignties. In that natural evolutionary competition, there is no guarantee that we will find ourselves the survivor. He went on to say that many defense mechanisms inherent in our evolved biological capabilities 
thus mitigate the pandemic viral threat. Mitigation also is built into the evolution of the virus. It is a period victory for a virus to eradicate its source. This may have happened historically, but then both the vanquished host and the victorious parasite will have disappeared. Even the death of a single infected individual is relatively disadvantageous in the long run to the virus, compared with a sustained infection that leaves a carrier free to spread the virus to as many contacts as possible. From the perspective of the virus, the ideal would be a nearly symptomless infection in which the host is oblivious of providing shelter and nourishment for the indefinite propagation of the virus genes. When in the early stages of the pandemic, we refused to admit to community transmission, we refused to admit symptomless infections. What we were doing was not reading the literature of the past and the warnings of the past. Lederberg wrote in 1988, at evolutionary equilibrium, we would continue to share the planet with our internal and external parasites, paying some tribute perhaps, sometimes deriving them from some protection against more violent aggressions. The terms of that equilibrium are unwelcome. Present knowledge does not offer much hope that we can eradicate the competition. He says our parasites and ourselves must share in the dues payable in a currency of discomfort and precariousness of life. No theory lets us calculate the details. We can hardly be sure that such an equilibrium for Earth even includes the human species, even as we contrive to eliminate some of the others. Our propensity for technological sophistication, harness to intraspecies competition, is a further dimension of hazard. He also says, and I conclude really, and coming to the end, as one species, we share a Never sent to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Having heard Lederberg, you might ask the question of natural evolution. A bat virus going through intermediate hosts, eventually adapting itself to the human host. Or was it the result of laboratory creation? Do molecular biologists today have the ability to create these viruses in the laboratory? The answer is yes, they do, because the virus which dominated the influenza pandemic of 1918 was recreated some years ago in the laboratory, completely by a synthetic process. But this argument will go on and it will never be resolved, it will never be resolved. But when lake, it's called a tiger, written in the 18th Mortal hand frame thy fierce proximity. See, did he who made the lamb make thee? So he looked at the lamb. The characteristic of, of course, we don't know who made it, and we are not in a position much different from Blake. But in thinking about the origins of the coronavirus, I was reminded of two quotations by John Lacar, who wrote these spy novels, which I used to be fond of when I was young. In one of them, he said, survival is an infinite capacity for suspicion. And in the other, he said that a desk is a dangerous place from which to watch the world. And over the last 18 months or so, most of us have watched the world from our desks. What are the lessons that we might learn from the pandemic? One, I think, is most important is that nature periodically provides a reminder of the limits of human arrogance. And when I say human arrogance, this is the arrogance of scientists, it's the arrogance of politicians, it's sometimes the arrogance of people who believe that they can predict the future and that they can control it. Nature also demonstrates that the frontiers of science are truly endless. I've really borrowed here a phrase from Vannevar Bush's famous report 
to the American president called science the endless frontier. What I've learned also is that biology assisted by the chemistry of molecular variation is a formidable force of nature. And therefore, if we learn these, we might in fact be better prepared in retrospect to have a more detailed analysis of what we have learned from the coronavirus pandemic. Lastly, in concluding, I must thank the two institutions which have provided me shelter for much of my professional life. Uh, the Indian Institute of Science on the top left, where I spent a marvelous four year, four decades plus, uh, where I was formally associated, and the National Center for Biological Sciences, which has provided me a retirement form. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Balram. Uh, it's really a wonderful talk. Uh, we have a little time, maybe five minutes for questions, if anybody would like to ask. Uh, I would like to ask a question, Devang. May I? Yes, please go ahead, Raiti. Professor Balram, that was a very, very, very interesting lecture. And I wanted to ask you something very specific, actually. You presented all those nice uh, sequences from NCBI. Uh, which were really organized nicely, and you could really do a very nice analysis from that. And I'm, I noticed that there were no Indian sequences there. And, you know, we have done a lot of sequencing in India as well. And I'm wondering, what is the, uh, is it possible to analyze those as well? Are they well, accessible? What is the status there? No, I would, I, I'm sure you can always analyze them uh, if they are available openly. There are some Indian sequences. There are about 3,000 Indian sequences in NCBI. The majority of them have been done by institutions which are not part of the INSACOG consortium. The Gujarat Biotechnology Center, sometimes a few sequences from NIMHANS, Bangalore Medical College, and so on, have been deposited. This is a very small number, 3,000 compared, and from very limited geographical areas. And, uh, one can do the same thing. The trends are the same. You look at the Gujarat Biotechnology Center data, it turns out that in the first part of 2021, you know, India declared victory over the coronavirus in January of 2021. But in February of 2021 and in March of 2021, you can see at one point both the alpha variants and the delta variant circulate. But very, if they are both present, the Delta variant takes over very, very quickly. And uh, so these mutations have happened faster here. And the Delta variant came here. I don't believe these variants are particularly ex exported. Uh, human populations can generate these variants uh, over time. And there are some variants which are immune escape variants where you have deletions. I think they might have some component of uh, uh, what you would call human immunological genetic makeup. Mm -hmm. So an African population and an Indian population and a Caucasian population might be different. But by and large, uh, there is so much of diversity in many populations in the US that you find all mutations are actually present. Right. But the use, the use of this uh, information that is available, uh, perhaps that is what has not been done with uh, sufficient thought in terms of managing the pandemic. I, I, I will tell you what it has taught me. I'm not uh, a public health person. I'm not a policy person or anything. What it has taught me is this, that uh, nature and all of us put together have done this marvelous experiment in sequence variation over a very short period of time. And there's only one biological species which is infected and everything's very. And you can see Darwin at work. And what amazes me is Darwin is at work on sequences which I can understand. They're not only chemicals. Uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Dr. Balram. Yeah, we... Go ahead, sir. Why you think, if you think the first Huan sequence, which was D, is actually an error? To start with, it was GOT. No, the, the first new Wuhan sequence which charted was not 
the Wuhan sequence originally reported has a D, reported has a D, and if you look at the data, there are lots of Ds available. Okay, there are also some Gs, but the bulk of them are Ds. In fact, if you look at that, there are now three thousand sequences in this limited database, which are all only originally D. The D to G mutation is a driver. Once it happens, even it very quickly takes over. And that's what you see when you draw this. There are some interesting things which I am not comfortable with, which I, and I thought this wasn't a technical lecture. But if you, there are probably many different ways of analyzing this data. And it's going to keep people busy for a long time. Now, one of the problems when we talk, and the government does a lot of this, a big data analysis should be more than a slogan. A big data analysis must come down to brass stacks. And uh, one of my purposes actually in showing those figures today, because I hope that some INSA members who are in fact influential people always, especially if they're there in Delhi, would in fact take some enthusiastic interest in making data publicly available and data curated in a manner that different sets of people can handle it. Uh, curating data is important. Making data publicly available is very important. I think we should not keep anything secret. Um, is that Balram? Uh, I'm Dr. N.K. Mehra from Ames, Delhi. I wanted to ask you that the two decades of the 21st century has already seen three coronavirus infections. We saw that in 2002 and 2012 and now. What made the other two, the first and the second, uh, have a very high fatality rate? You know, with the, with the coronavirus three that we are talking about, even though we have close to 270 million cases around the world and more than 5.5 million deaths, but the case fatality rate in that is still very, very low. Uh, Dr. Mehra, I'm sure most of you know this much better than me. And I hate to say this when things are being uh, recorded, but I would say that as a layman looking at this from a distance, I would say SARS-CoV-2 has been a relatively benign virus. Yes. And its ability to spread, I mean, I would hate to use this word benign, but compared to uh, SARS-CoV-1, see, if a virus causes a very large number of fatalities very quickly, like Ebola or something, then the public health system, I think, springs into action and isolates and prevents transmission. The most dangerous virus is the virus which now is going to spread in populations without causing too much damage. This is what I call Wuhan zero. And evolution now, you see whether a virus, however it's come, once it's in the human host, it's now going to adapt to the human host. And as Lederberg so eloquently says, adapting each an amicable equilibrium, even if that equilibrium is an uneasy go to, but uh, you're causing discomfort uh, to one another uh, every now and then. And uh, I think that's what's happened here. Much of the transmission was symptomless transmission. Much of the transmission would have been uh, done by travelers who flew out and went. And as the virus spread, random mutations accumulated, these are selected. If you look at the time course of these mutations, there are lots of other mutations which happen. There is, for example, one it died out, get up and die out. And this provides an example of biological evolution of the virus. This is the same way that bacteria, even animals evolve, only their time scales are different. Uh, there are any number of biological species which have become naturally extinct. 
on a virus, if you study this, if, if I consider each variant as a species, then species appear and they die. They are evolutionary experiments. Now, SARS-CoV-2 now is here to stay in, uh, uh, in, a, in a certain form where it's going to cause mild disease. And what I think all medical uh, professionals are sort of uh, working, they are sort of accepting that now over time. But you can see that at a molecular level. And that's what amazed me, I must say. Uh, my amazement is more the basis of my ignorance when I began, uh, rather than uh, anything else. I, I would... Any, another question? Professor, yeah, Professor Balram, I am uh, totally naive to your area of research. May I ask a simple question? Can you predict what will be the next version of this mutation and what precautions we can take? Uh, you know, Professor Yadav, you, uh, I, I'm only being uh, lighthearted here. Uh, I've never failed to be surprised by the arrogance of mathematical modelers <laughs> who will predict the course of a pandemic. And uh, uh, I've never failed also to be surprised by the arrogance of politicians who can very quickly declare victory. Uh, over biology, uh, declaring victory is a dangerous thing. And I think in case of understanding biology, I think our most uh, important attribute, I think, would be humility in the face of ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> a good one. A good one. Nice answer. <laughs> Thank you. So we can take one last question and then uh, we can close this session. So if there is any more, anyone else has a question? Can I ask you, Balram? You said that the D614 G has now stayed up. I mean, it is probably the mutation that makes the virus uh, enter the uh, AC2. The others are in the spike. And, uh, and, and what makes them or could make them evade immunity? Uh, this is mere speculation. But there is some literature coming up on this. The problem is that the literature is such, Professor Mera now, no single individual, leave alone a geriatric individual, uh -huh, is uh, capable of keeping up with it. And uh, you need a lot of team of people who are actually analyzing what other data other people are putting out. But most importantly, in both the alpha and the delta variants, have been deletions and mutations in the end terminal domain, which have deleted big side chains of amino acids and replaced very big side chains with very small side chains. These are a signal because the N-terminus domain is not involved in the other infectivity functions, are likely to be immune escape. There are also interesting mutations coming up in the S2 domain of the protein, which is the lower part. The Colin cartoon, which I showed, uh, actually shows these three regions. Receptor binding domain immune escape mutants, I think, have reached a plateau. It's not going to change very much because you can't have too many mutations there. It, it might affect the receptor binding function itself. But in the N-terminal domain and, the, and in the S2 domain, which is the peptide repeat region and all, you might get mutations. So I think one might keep a watch for uh, this variant itself sort of attenuating and uh, not in terms of sequence but in terms of human response I hate to say this but when you say uh, when you look at death tolls eventually the virus is attacking susceptible population so evolution is happening on both the human host and the viral pathogen well, D1 
614 d is the only gainer function the rest are selective adaptation function uh, no i would say one more gain of function is p681 r which has okay. dramatically increased uh, furan inhibitor and i wouldn't rule out the possibility that there may be one more gain of function which affects fusion the internal all other processes which involved with viral replication which take place inside the cell they are such complicated chemical processes that you can't speed them up beyond the point uh, see uh, i did write this uh, for a common audience in current times a uh, receptor binding is what i would call a physical process it's a non covalent interaction between atoms Furan cleavage is a chemical process, but a very simple chemical process of proteolytic cleavage. You can speed it up a little bit, but you can't speed up more complicated assembly processes inside the cell easily. Mr. Balram, I have a. I'm going to read out a question from Ram Ramaswamy, who typed it in the chat box. Yeah. Will it be possible to keep up on the vaccine front by developing specific vaccines for each of the variants? that's ram's question ram i'll give you my answer if i were younger <laughs> i would go get myself an mba degree and join the management of one of the vaccine companies i think <laughs> they're going to do very well in the future and you'll already find that the modern chief scientist says that the new variant will escape vaccines because it is in the interest of pharmaceutical companies that you keep getting variants So on that happy note, uh, I think uh, we can close this session. Thank you very much, Professor Belram. That was really an incredible talk, and uh, I'm sure all, all the fellows enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, thank you. Look forward to hearing you again. Bye bye, thank you and thanks to all the members who attended. Thank you, thank you, Professor Belram. <laughs>